इलेक्ट्रॉनिक मीडिया प्रोडक्शन एंड रिसर्च सेंटर ईएमपीआरसी ऑफ मध्य प्रदेश भोज ओपन यूनिवर्सिटी प्रेजेंट्स एन ऑडियो प्रोग्राम ऑन विजुअल इम्पेयरमेंट दिस ऑडियो प्रोग्राम विल बी यूजफुल टू द स्टूडेंट्स ऑफ बीएड स्पेशल एजुकेशन प्रोग्राम द टाइटल ऑफ ऑडियो प्रोग्राम इज सेंटर बेस्ड रिहेबिलिटेशन फॉर पर्सन विद विजुअल इम्पेयरमेंट टू डिलीवर द लेक्चर ऑन दिस टॉपिक we have invited our subject expert dr nora griffin shelle she is a professor in the program of special education at texas tech university in lubbock texas in the united states of america this audio program is recorded edited and presented by amar bahadur yadav now let us listen to the audio program center based rehabilitation for persons with visual impairment Hello dear listeners I'm a professor in the special education program in the Department of Educational Psychology and Leadership in the College of Education at Texas Tech University in Lubbock, Texas in the United States. In addition, I also coordinate the orientation and mobility specialist program and I am the director of the Virginia Murray Sow Center for Research and Education in Visual Impairment. I have been teaching in a university system for over 20 years. I would like to thank M P Bosch Open University for this opportunity to speak to you today about rehabilitation services for individuals with visual impairment. Rehabilitation services are delivered through center-based programs and community-based programs. The lecture is about center-based rehabilitation programs for persons with visual impairment. The topic of community-based rehabilitation will be delivered in a subsequent program. Questions you may ask concerning center-based rehabilitation programs are 1. What are the origins of rehabilitation? 2. What does rehabilitation training include? And 3. What is center-based programs? The major points mentioned in part 1, community-based rehabilitation for persons with visual impairments were 1. Community-based rehabilitation is a goal-oriented need-based, cost-effective, and results-oriented strategy of providing time-bound and appropriate services within the community with its active participation, involvement, and with fullest use of its resources. 2. Community-based rehabilitation is a model that is used worldwide, especially to provide rehabilitation in developing countries like India. 3. Historically, the call for rehabilitation programs to be offered in rural areas was made in the 1950s. Most people with visual impairment in India are living in rural areas, are older, and are women. The leading causes of blindness are cataracts, trachoma, and vitamin A deficiency. 5. In India, Rehabilitation centers are few in number, expensive to operate, and are usually located in urban areas, thus not meeting the needs of the majority of adults with visual impairment in India who live in rural areas. 6. There are prerequisite skills for students with visual impairment to gain prior to their involvement in a rehabilitation program. 
Seven, the components of community-based rehabilitation include covering people of all ages, being cost-effective and result-oriented, realistic and need-based, and in consonance with state policy, including aspects of prevention and cure of curable disabilities, certification of incurable disability, social integration, integrated education, economic rehabilitation, support services and concession, advocacy rights of persons with disabilities, act as a pressure group for influencing state policies, community empowerment and participation, and the utilization of community resources. Eight, the characteristics of community-based rehabilitation are centered on the integration of community-based rehabilitation services into existing networks such as healthcare, education, and developmental services. Nine, rehabilitation workers and educators collaborate with one another to identify children with disabilities and to provide appropriate referrals for medical care and education. 10. Once a child with a visual impairment is in a formal school setting, then the rehabilitation field worker's job is done and the itinerant teacher with visual impairment takes over. 11. Monitoring and evaluation of community-based rehabilitation must be carried out on a regular basis. Specific evaluation indicators are suggested for an evaluation team to review. The vocabulary for today's lecture includes 1. Rehabilitation, a training program provided to persons with visual impairment aiming at ensuring skill enhancement, independence, self-reliance, self-confidence, complete integration, and empowerment of the individual, as defined by Panani, Raiol, and Sajit in their book, Manual Community-Based Rehabilitation. 2. Rehabilitation Center, a place where people with disabilities go to receive training to improve the quality of their lives, their functionality, to learn self-determination and self-advocacy skills, and coping strategies to deal with their disability. 3. Client, the person with a visual impairment or disability who is receiving training in rehabilitation. The objectives for today's lecture are to define rehabilitation and its history, to describe center-based rehabilitation programs for persons with visual impairment, and three, to identify the advantages and disadvantages of center-based rehabilitation programs. As stated earlier in the vocabulary section, rehabilitation is a training program provided to persons with visual impairment aimed at ensuring skill enhancement, independence, self-reliance, self-confidence, complete integration, and empowerment of the individual, as defined by Panani, Raul, and Saja in their book, Manual Community-Based Rehabilitation. Similarly, the World Program of Action Concerning Disabled People defines rehabilitation as a goal-oriented and time-limited process aimed at enabling an impaired person to reach an optimum mental, physical, and or social functional level, thus providing him or her the tools to change her or his own life. It can involve measures intended to compensate for loss of function or functional limitation and other measures intended to facilitate social adjustment or readjustment, as defined in Krishna, Dutt, and Rayo's book, Disabled People. The typical services provided through rehabilitation are many. They include early detection, diagnosis, and intervention, medical care and treatment, social, psychological, and other types of counseling and assistance, training and self-care activities, including mobility, communication, and daily living skills, with special provisions as needed for people with hearing impairment, visual impairment, and with mental retardation, provision of technical and mobility aids and other devices, specialized education services, vocational rehabilitation services, including vocational guidance, vocational training, placement in open or sheltered employment, and follow-up. For example, 
In some cases, vocational training provides disabled people the opportunity to make prosthetic devices. Rehabilitation can occur in a center-based program or a community-based program, which we already discussed in Part 1. A rehabilitation center is a place where people with disabilities go to receive training to improve the quality of their lives, their functionality, and to learn self-advocacy skills and coping strategies to deal with their disability. I use Carl E. Oberman's book, A History of Vocational Rehabilitation in America, as a reference for the next portion of my lecture on the history of rehabilitation. The history of rehabilitation for people with blindness can be traced back to the 4th century, when St. Basil started a hospice for people who are blind. In the 5th century, St. Lemonaeus began a hospice in Syria, while in the 13th century, Louis IX of France started an asylum for disabled soldiers hurt in the medieval crusades. In 1329, the Iceland Spittal Organization was established in England. In 1784, the Institut National was started by Valentin Way, a Frenchman. In 1791, the School for the Indigent Blind of Liverpool, England, was organized to teach its students of all ages music and mechanical arts. Other institutions for people with blindness were also established in the 1700s. The Asylum for Industrious Blind of Edinburgh and the School for the Indigent Blind of London. The London School had a workshop where they sold products such as rope, baskets, and earth mats made by students. These schools and asylums were the impetus for America and other nations to follow suit. In 1902, the Goodwill Industries started in Boston, Massachusetts of the United States. Over time, this organization provided training and employment for poor and disabled people. Likewise, in 1917, the American Red Cross established an institute for crippled and disabled for males and disabled vets or veterans. Early on, laws were established for people with disabilities to be compensated for these injuries. Slave owners who released their slaves were supposed to care for them if they became sick or disabled and also find them employment for their slaves. Additionally, legal responsibilities for injured or disabled are found in religious texts. The King James Version of the Old Testament in Exodus chapter 21, verse 26 states, And if a man smite the eye of his servant, or the eye of his maid, that it perish, he shall let go free for his eye's sake. Likewise, in paragraph 206 of the Code of Hammurabi, it is mentioned that a person who injures another person must pay for the medical expenses. Now, we're going to talk about rehabilitation for people with visual impairment in a center-based program. Center-based programs can be either residential or day programs or both. Many programs are residential to accommodate individuals who are blind who live at a distance. Obviously, clients who are attending a center-based day program usually live in the same city the center is located in and commute from their homes. Most center-based programs are comprehensive, providing referrals for medical treatment, counseling, instruction in daily living skills, recreation and leisure activities, vocational skills, coping strategies, orientation and mobility, low vision devices, use of assistive technology, involvement in support groups or self-help groups, and follow-up in the client's home area. A counselor will develop an individualized rehabilitation plan with each student. The rehabilitation plan outlines the roles and responsibilities of the rehabilitation agency and the client. It includes goals and objectives to meet the goals of the client. For example, a goal may be, Akmal will demonstrate how to use a long cane when traveling. Specific objectives to meet this orientation goal are, 1. Akmal will state the different parts of a cane and why a cane is useful to people who are blind. 2. Akma will show how to travel with a cane when utilizing a human guide indoors and outside. 3. Akma will demonstrate how to store a cane when seated in a car or a bus, in a restaurant, 
and in other public buildings. 4. Akma will demonstrate two-point touch cane technique indoors and outside. 5. Akma will show how to take care of his cane and replace various parts like the tip when it wears down with usage. 6. Akma will demonstrate how to use a cane when crossing a street independently, when walking in a field with high grass and along a footpath. Upon completion of a center-based rehabilitation program, it is crucial to have follow-up in the client's home. The client has learned new skills and her family needs to recognize this and support her in using these newly acquired skills in her home. The rehabilitation worker can assist with this reintegration into the client's community by counseling family, friends, and prospective employers. Additionally, orientation and mobility training may need to be provided by an orientation and mobility instructor to assist the client with traveling in his home area and to and from his new workplace. Upon returning home, the client would benefit from making contact with the local self-help groups for persons with disabilities for continued support to assist with the transition from the supportive environment of the rehabilitation center to the home environment. The members of this local group may be individuals the client has known in the past. These members can also decide what needs to be accomplished in their community to make their lives easier. The self-help group can develop a plan of action to rectify the barriers to independence the members face in their own community. Here is a case study to illustrate what I've been lecturing about. Sita, a 72-year-old woman with macular generation, is attending a center-based rehabilitation center for people who are visually impaired that is two kilometers from her home. She lives with her son and daughter-in-law and has two grandchildren. Her husband died four years ago. She is retired after working as an archivist for a museum featuring tribal cultures. Sita's visual acuity is 2300 in her right eye and 2400 in her left eye. Her ophthalmologist has informed her that there is no treatment available for her eye condition. Sita has also been told by her ophthalmologist that she will not lose all of her vision. Sita is interested in the low vision aids she has heard about from her friend Rajni, who also has macular degeneration. When Rajni went to visit her daughter Gita in America, she went to a low vision clinic and received a magnifier, a closed circuit television, and a telescope, and learned modifications to help her with her cooking, cleaning, writing, reading, and mobility. Rajni is amazed at what she can see and do with these devices and training. Sita is receiving a low vision evaluation, an orientation mobility evaluation, and an overall assessment of her daily living skills at the center she is attending. Sita's goal is to take care of her two grandchildren again as her son and daughter-in-law work full time. They have not felt comfortable leaving their children with her since her vision has deteriorated. Center-based rehabilitation programs have advantages and disadvantages. One advantage is that all services are located under one roof in a supportive environment where there are many people with blindness. A client can go to the center and have his rehabilitation goals met if he is highly motivated. Instruction is provided in an intensive manner on a daily basis. Therefore, the client does not have to travel to many different locations or wait for various rehabilitation workers to visit him once or twice a week in his home. This daily instruction enables the client to progress quickly and sequentially through a set curriculum. A client can share his progress and challenges with other clients in an informal manner at the day's end. For example, sometimes a client may have gotten really lost on an orientation mobility lesson, which caused him a great deal of anxiety. After sharing his experience with other clients, the client soon realizes everyone has gotten lost on mobility lessons at one time or another. He can learn to actually laugh about getting disoriented, thus reducing his anxiety for the next day's orientation and mobility lesson. Other advantages include access to the latest assistive technology used by individuals with visual impairment, having highly qualified personnel who provide an interdisciplinary teaming model in service delivery to clients, having access to resources commonly used by persons with visual impairment, such as companies who supply products used by people who are blind, self-help organizations, 
medical equipment used by diabetics who are blind, for example, talking blood glucose monitors, blood pressure cuffs, talking scales, and adaptive equipment so blind diabetics can drop their own insulin, and role models who have graduated from a successful rehabilitation program and who may be employed at the center-based rehabilitation program. Some of the disadvantages of center-based rehabilitation program include the high cost of a center-based program, the limited number of people with visual impairments who receive services as compared to the number who actually need services, the urban location of centers while most of the population with visual impairment is from rural areas, and the lack of follow-up in clients' villages. Even though advantages and disadvantages exist with the center-based rehabilitation, a need for this model is still warranted. To meet some of these disadvantages, non-government organizations have developed outreach rehabilitation programs, including the placement of residential centers in rural areas to serve the rural population with visual impairment. For example, the Sri Ramna Marishi Academy for the Blind has three community-based rehabilitation programs in Madhya and Bangalore rural districts serving over 15,000 people with disabilities, including those with impairment. Additionally, in 1985, the school established the Trimurti Rural Development Center to serve disabled males from rural areas who are 14 to 40 years of age. These rural centers are committed to training their students to become craftsmen of local crafts. Let's look at a case study to illustrate this practice. Ramesh is a 14-year-old boy with total blindness and paralysis on his left side that he received from a fall he had at the age of four years. Being from a family of six boys, his parents are farmers. Ramesh's parents would like him to learn skills he can use to help them out with the farm work. They also want him to learn to live at home in South India and to eventually be married and have a family of his own. Ramesh is a happy young man with average intelligence. His grandfather heard from a family friend about a residential program for males with disabilities about 80 kilometers from Ramesh's village. The program offers training courses in agriculture, beekeeping, horticulture, dairy farming, poultry, fish culture, and tailoring. After Ramesh's grandfather told his parents about the program, they decided to contact the program's administration. Ramesh is enrolled in the program for next fall. Ramesh is a little scared about leaving home, but he is interested in learning new skills. In conclusion, the major points to remember from today's lecture are, one, the history of rehabilitation for people with blindness can be traced back to the fourth century when St. Basil started a hospice for people who are blind. Two, rehabilitation can occur in a center-based program or a community-based program. Three, a rehabilitation center is a place where people with disabilities go to receive training to improve the quality of their lives, their functionality, and to learn self-advocacy skills and coping strategies to deal with their disability. Four, most center-based programs are comprehensive, providing referrals for medical treatment, counseling, instruction in daily living skills, recreation and leisure activities, vocational skills, coping strategies, orientation and mobility, low vision devices, use of assistive technology, involvement in support groups, and follow-up in the client's home area. Five, the individual rehabilitation plan outlines the roles and responsibilities of the rehabilitation agency and the client, stating the client's goals and objectives to meet these goals. Six, center-based rehabilitation programs have advantages and disadvantages. However, a need for this type of program still exists. Seven, non-government organizations have developed outreach rehabilitation programs, including the placement of residential centers in rural areas to serve the rural population with visual impairment of India. I hope you have gained some new information today concerning the rehabilitation process used in India for persons with visual impairment that you can use with your work with the students you teach. Thank you for listening. You are listening to the audio program 
सेंटर बेस्ड रिहेबिलिटेशन फॉर पर्सन विद विजुअल इम्पेयरमेंट द सब्जेक्ट एक्सपर्ट एंड स्पीकर वॉज डॉक्टर नोरा ग्रिफिन शेरले अनाउंसर वॉज गौतम मालविया दिस प्रोग्राम वॉज रिकॉर्डेड एडिटेड एंड प्रेजेंटेड बाय अमर बहादुर यादव दिस वॉज एन ऑडियो प्रोडक्शन ऑफ द इलेक्ट्रॉनिक मीडिया प्रोडक्शन एंड रिसर्च सेंटर ई एम पी आर सी ऑफ मध्य प्रदेश भोज ओपन यूनिवर्सिटी